The universe is a vast place filled with incredible things, much of which we don't really understand yet. It's not particularly surprising. Most of the universe is uh, very difficult to observe. With your own eyes, you can only see a few thousand stars, all very local, found within our own galaxy, the Milky Way. You can actually see a couple of other galaxies with your eyes as well, tiny, faint smudges of light in the sky, like the Andromeda Galaxy a few million light years from Earth. That means that light, the fastest thing in the universe, takes a few million years to get from there to here. And yet even that is still incredibly local, part of our galactic neighborhood. Now it's only with powerful telescopes, like the James Webb Space Telescope, that we're capable of peering deep into the dark and seeing that the sky is absolutely filled with galaxies. There may be as many as a trillion of them out there. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but they all have one thing in common. At the centers of every large galaxy in the universe, there exists a sleeping giant, a behemoth. The single heaviest objects in the universe, at least as far as we know. And if we're right about them, they might easily fit inside a full stop. They're called supermassive black holes. Now, as exotic as black holes sound, they're actually quite common. There are millions of them scattered across our galaxy alone. It's just that the vast majority of them are far more modest. These smaller, stellar mass black holes, they're the leftovers of stars that have come to the ends of their lives, albeit very big stars, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun or more. You see, a star's life is a constant battle between gravity trying to crush the star down and pressure and heat pushing back out, holding the star stable. But when the fuel runs out, the core begins to go cold. The pressure drops and gravity wins as it was always going to. The star collapses, but as it does so, that causes the star to heat up massively. The pressure increases again, the whole thing rebounds and explodes as a supernova. The outer layers of the star are flung out into deep space at incredible speeds, but the core of the star isn't so lucky. Crushed down to incredibly small proportions, to the point where gravity takes over completely, and that there is no force in the universe that we know of that can stop it from crushing the object down to an infinitesimal point. Zero size, but incredible mass, a singularity. Even if that's not strictly speaking true, because there's something we don't know about yet that stops it from going all the way to zero, it will nonetheless be very small, and from our point of view, kind of doesn't matter, because the end result is the same, a black hole, which is a terribly named object. It really is. Black holes are not holes. They're objects. They just happen to be really very small, that's all. That's all. And they're also not technically black, although if uh, Stephen Hawking was right about them, then they do produce a small amount of light. But they are very, very dark. You see, anything that gets too close to a black hole cannot escape again, including light which means that we can't get light out of a black hole in order to see what they look like. The supermassive black holes, they're similar in some ways, but far more massive. We don't know how they form. We don't really understand how they grow or change over time, but we do know they're incredibly heavy. Millions, if not billions of times the mass of our sun. We can use radio telescopes connected across the entirety of the world, effectively making a radio telescope the size of our entire planet to see the faint gas and dust swirling around the outside of one of these black holes. The black hole itself hidden in the very center in a gravity shadow, dark, invisible. But the outside, the environment, available to us to study. We think that these black holes are incredibly important. Too important, if we're honest. You see, for as massive and heavy as they are, 
they still make up a tiny fraction of the mass of the galaxy that they're found within. Yes, they're at the center of the galaxy, but that's not because the galaxy is orbiting around the black hole. It's because, like a, a rock dropped into a pond, it has sunk down into the center. And yet, despite the fact that these black holes shouldn't have a huge influence over their, their galaxy, they do. And we think we know why. You see, not all of these sleeping giants are actually sleeping. Some of them are awake, feeding. Vast quantities of gas and dust funneled from the rest of the galaxy down into the black hole. We know of black holes out there that are eating the equivalent of a sun per day. That's quite the appetite. And this gas and dust, as it's forced into the black hole, heats up to many thousands of degrees Celsius and glows. In fact, they can outshine the rest of the galaxy combined. Which means that black holes, these inherently dark objects, are found at some of the brightest places in the universe, if they're feeding. And this light has an effect, permeating through the rest of the galaxy, pushing back against that gas and dust found throughout the rest of the galaxy, triggering star formation in some places, cutting it off entirely in others. The black hole works like a sort of a tap, turning on the growth of the galaxy or turning it off, regulating how it grows, ensuring that the black hole grows with the galaxy. At least we think that's how it works. 90% sure, 70% at best. Because here's the thing, it all seems to make sense, but the fine detail's missing. What we really want to do is we want to observe a black hole feeding all the way from the beginning of its feast right the way through to the end. See how that affects the black hole, the galaxy, everything. There's only one problem with that. These banquets take a while. About 100 million years, give or take. And I don't have that much patience. Sorry, I've got things to do. So, how do we solve that problem? What to do, what to do? Well, we could just chuck a star at one. Not us, we can't do that. But the universe does all the time. Stars pass close to the central supermassive black hole in our own galaxy once every 100,000 years or so. And you might be thinking, that's still quite a long time. That's true. But I don't just have my galaxy to watch. We've got lots of galaxies. If I look at 100,000 different galaxies and just wait, I'll expect to see a star get too close to the central supermassive black hole once per year. That could probably do. And there are a lot more galaxies out there than just 100,000. What happens when the star gets too close to the black hole is an extreme version of something that happens here on Earth all the time, the tides. You see, the tides on Earth are caused mostly by the moon. The moon's gravity pulls on the surface of the Earth, bunching together the oceans and water on one side. But the side that's facing away is actually in a lower gravitational pull, so it actually relaxes and ends up with a bunch on the other side as well. One side, one high tide facing the moon, one high tide facing away. That's why we get two tides per day. The Earth is spinning underneath these two tides. When a star passes too close to the supermassive black hole, it's a tad bit more catastrophic. One side of the star is pulled and torn apart by the black hole. The other side is flung out into deep space. The result is that half of the black hole ends up getting forced into, sorry, half of the star, it gets forced into the black hole, feeding upon it in exactly the same way as awake black holes feed on gas and dust. And in exactly the same way, they produce vast amounts of light, flares that we can see at incredible distances. There's even a variant of these tidal disruption events, as they're known, which I studied, that produce beams of light. 
like a torch held out into the universe. And if we on the Earth in our galaxy happen to be along the line of sight of that beam, then the event is magnified, made much, much brighter, capable of being seen halfway across the universe or more. And the further back, the further away that you look in the universe, the further back in time you're looking, because the amount of time it's taken for the light to reach us is growing as you go further and further away. So by looking halfway across the universe, we're looking halfway back in time or further. Events like this could enable us to learn how black holes feed, how they change, how they evolve over time, even work out how these big black holes form in the first place. A very open question. They'll likely solve, answer many of the questions that we have about black holes and the galaxies that they reside in, but undoubtedly they'll produce more questions as well. This is how science works. You find out something new and then you realize how much more you don't yet know. Some people might call that irritating. Scientists call it job security. <laughs> but there's only one question I want to focus on for the last couple of minutes, and that's this. With all of this brilliant science being done, with new telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope and the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, a ground-based telescope that's going to be scanning the skies and finding so many of these bursts of light that we honestly don't know what we're going to do with them. With all of this brilliant science going on, why am I not doing it anymore? Because I'm not. I haven't been a researcher in seven years. And that may not sound like an eternity, but it's quite a long time to be out of the game. You might have heard how difficult research can be. Long hours, high stress, publish or perish. And it's all true. But then again, research is also exciting. It's a collaborative effort to learn something that no one else has ever known before. It's exhilarating. So that wasn't it. No, the reason why I'm not doing research anymore is because of this. Not this today. This is an example of it. Science communication, SciCom. I now work at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich alongside a team of brilliant science communicators who are all working to educate and entertain people on the topics of astronomy, physics, and science in general. We do it partly because we just really enjoy it, but partly because practically every scientist who has ever discovered anything of any note ever, at one point, had someone communicate science to them. Got them hooked. It might have been a parent, a teacher, a slightly excitable ex-researcher working at a world-class observatory. I don't know. But something did it. And yes, I may be showing them brilliant images of the cosmos today, but that not, is not necessarily the image that they'll take away in a few years' time. Maybe they'll find the molecular structure of the next superconductor more interesting, the elegance of the human immune system, the output of an MRI machine. If I can get just a few people interested and on track to doing scientific research, then I'll have replaced myself and more besides in fields beyond my own. And frankly, we do need the help. Because after all, the universe is vast, filled with incredible things, much of which we don't yet understand. Thanks very much. <laughs>